Good morning. Namaste. So, last time we talked about the argument or premise of Tantra. The argument or premise of Tantra, as incorporated into Secret Heaven, is to open up fully the lower three chakras, sex, energy, and movement. Okay. So, what leverage do we have over these uh, agglomerations of phenomena? You know, a, a vortex always has different resonances. So, each chakra resonates at a particular frequency or density of manifestation. Now, sometimes people criticize the lower chakras because they're more dense, more material, huh? concerned with the body, and so on. Uh, but even enlightened people still eat, they still sleep, or something like that. <laughs> They still go to the bathroom every day, just like every one of us. And why not have sex? Well, because there's a religious prohibition against it. And in previous series, we've gone into the whole history of how the cooperation between the priests and the politicians, and kings especially, was to suppress um, any kind of... Uh, fun sexuality and emphasize reproductive sexuality so that the tribe would grow bigger and be able to conquer or at least resist its enemies. But what do we do now in a world where we don't have tribes and recreational sex is certainly an option and recreational sex because it's non-procreative doesn't require for example that couples are composed of male and female see? Or uh, what about group sex? Things can get splendidly complicated. <laughs> but what I'm here today to, to talk about is what you have to do, you as an individual, okay? Let's get into relationships in the next episode. Um, what you have to do as an individual to advance on the path is to gain access to your full energy. Uh, your complete Shakti, your original Chi, as Qigong would describe it, that which makes you what you are. Hmm? From a devotional point of view, of course, that's the goddess, the generative principle, the manifest manifestative energy <laughs> of God, or goddess. Okay. Uh, but from a personal perspective, it's the sex energy. Kundalini. Huh? Kunda. Kunda is a word that can mean a pond, a pot, or any depression. And there's a, a Agni Kunda is the bowl, the vessel, the sacrificial uh, implement to hold the sacred fire. So the sacred fire of life is held in the root chakras. And if you want to include sexuality in that, you can. Because generally in that area, reproduction takes place. So yeah, you can say it's a low vibration. Yeah, you can say it's very deep in matter and all of that. Yeah, but without it, none of us would exist. So you gotta give the credit. You, and that means worship. Okay, so how do you worship the goddess? Well, in every temple, in every goddess temple in India, there's also a Shiva Lingam. And what is a Lingam? A Lingam is a penis, a phallus, a vertical shaft <laughs> of various dimensions. And that is worshipped. As that, it was uh, Devi's principal duty toward Shiva was to worship his lingam. 
So what does that myth mean? What is its significance for us? It means that we have to give satisfaction to the feminine principle in us. And when she's pleased, I can tell you from experience, you will get the ride of your life. <laughs> You will get the most incredible experiences. So, so anyway, we'll get into that later. Or I've already described all that in a previous series. And you can go look that up. Um, I'm trying to get to the point that to open these lower chakras fully requires that you have some knowledge of your taste. Your particular... Oh, I guess you could call it a fantasy, or you could call it a, uh, um, a fetish. Huh? The thing that turns you on, the thing that brings you toward orgasm the most. What do you think of, you know? What do you fantasize about when you're having an orgasm? What, what is that mood? Now, I know people whose taste is so... Uh, conventional uh -huh. that going out to the club for a night of drinks and dancing to whatever popular music or whatever is considered <laughs> the taste that you know lead it's like it leads them onward on the path to the ecstasy of mating okay but if you Look at it from a psychological point of view. It's like to want to have your senses tickled by somebody else, whether it's a band or a social occasion or uh, an intoxicant or a particular um, set of circumstances. Huh? Like some guys like to lounge around a pool, right? <laughs> They don't really care about their tan. It's about watching the girls. And then what do they do? They go in their room and satisfy themselves. Or maybe they pick up one of the girls or whatever. So they're trying to build a, a certain mood, which in this case is like pretty low and selfish. But, but get, try to understand my point. This is a, this is a taste a taste which leads that particular individual forward to open up their sex energy, okay, which uh, pre, a prelude to intimacy, okay, something that sparks the desire, puts you in the mood. Everybody's got one, and it's all very individual. <laughs> As, as Kinsey and, and the other sex researchers found out. <laughs> Fantasies can be like all over the universe. Literally. So, in the next episode, we'll, we'll talk about more my personal taste. Okay? Because it influences everything I do, of course. Uh, but in this episode, I want to focus on the idea of taste. In general, in Sanskrit, this is called rati. Rati. Huh? We say when an animal is uh, in the mating season that they're in rut. Where does that word come from? Rata. Rata is related to rasa. Rasa means a drink, but especially a very concentrated taste, you know, like a fruit syrup, something really, really flavorful, rus. So when one gets rasa, that's rata. And you're in rut. <laughs> you're in heat. You're turned on, baby. You're hot. So we have so many different tastes and so many different moods because each of us has a different background. And then going back into past lives and everything. And uh, these are called vasanas. Vasanas come up 
any time we encounter a situation which resembles a previous situation in which there were strong emotions or, you know, something dramatic happened or whatever was really memorable. And all these memories stay in a section of the mind, you know, because they're charged with emotional energy. And what that means is that just the idea of them, just the memory of them, can kick our uh, uh, glandular system, I forget the proper medical term just now, endocrine system, into overdrive. And we go for, we go tripping on hormones and, and you know, chemicals like testosterone. Woo-wee! So, what we have to do is see what is that psychological trigger? What is that view? What is that taste? Uh, that rasa? That leads to rati. Rati means being turned on. <laughs> this is knowledge coming from the ancient Tantra Shastra. Everybody has a different view depending on their background. So a person like me, of course, I like to see that everything is connected. Huh? That I don't like to say it's all one, but what I like to say is that everything is connected. Everything influences everything else, right? Um, there's no real boundaries between myself and not self, okay? The idea, uh, the very idea of, of myself is a fabrication, is a lie. But we accept it as true for convenience sake, without which there would be no possibility of any communication uh, with language. So I use language conventionally because to do otherwise would be very inconvenient, you know? I'd, every time I would, in ordinary talk, I would say I or my, I would have to say this aggregate of phenomena. <laughs> it's incredibly awkward. So instead of doing that, I use the conventional language. But what I mean is that, okay, within the vortex of your body slash mind, the whole of you, uh, whatever it is that you define as you, there is a large set of memories. And this is what determines your karma. This is what determines your fate in life, uh, your destiny. Huh? Um, and it, what, what it is is a set of desires that come up automatically. ka huh? Every time a certain button is pressed. So... Uh, you know, if you see, for example, an attractive person of uh, whatever gender you prefer, <laughs> then that presses certain buttons deep in the brain stem that we have no conscious control over whatsoever, simply because these impressions are similar to some other impressions that we had in the past. That's how the mind works. It's just a filing system. Like, get over it. So... <laughs> When the mind sees that, oh, this present situation is similar to what happened then, it brings up the memory, either directly as a memory or indirectly as a feeling, an emotional response. And then you go into overdrive trying to <laughs> pursue this thing to resolve the previous situation. It's like armies are always getting ready to fight the last war, right? Right? Okay, so our minds are always getting ready to fight, to resolve the previous traumas. Okay, this is the basis of all psychology, psychological science, psychological treatment. Our approach is, <laughs> if you reach a certain uh, stage of self-awareness, then you can clearly discriminate, huh? unlike these fellows over here, <laughs> so dramatic, you know? 
This shall not pass. Huh? Rascals. And they hang out at the temple. That's what really gets me. They desecrate the temple. Mother Durga's carrier is a lion, not a dog. He should chase them away. <laughs> anyway. It's the dangers of on, on, of on location recording, right? I try to go over here where it's quieter. Okay. All these events push us to make certain responses. And the connections between the stimulus and the response is not always conscious. In fact, it's almost always unconscious or pre-conscious, not connected with our, uh, in particular, our social will. Oh, how we want to show up in society, or what we want other people to think of us, or whatever. So, here we are, <laughs> surfing the waves of sensory perceptions, and reacting involuntarily to different situations. And you could take the sum total of those uh, actual or potential reactions as one's taste. One's inbuilt, inbred, already hard-coded into the body uh, set of responses to different stimuli. So when you see anything that resembles your particular taste, it starts what the Buddha called a waterfall. Hmm? <laughs> uh, a cascade in the mind, where all these thoughts, based on these previous experiences, suddenly tumble out all at once <laughs> onto the table <laughs> of your attention. And it's impossible to resist them. I mean, you know, it's just physically or mentally, we, poor human beings don't have the willpower to counteract the machine of karma. Uh, ordinary willpower isn't enough. But what we need is the deep insight. Uh, that comes later on in the game. First of all, we have to get the energy to do the practices to get that deep insight. Or it's not going to happen. Okay, and I see so many people, so many people like come to Tear of Anomaly uh, intending to attain enlightenment. But what happens is something else. They get distracted. They get caught up in their games, you know. <laughs> I'm here, I'm literally walled off from the rest of the world. Huh? See this nice wall, complete with squirrel feeder. Walled off from the rest of the world in solitary, you know, in isolation, deliberately. I don't belong to any social groups, I don't attend any social functions, or even... Really, I mean, rarely, once a month, maybe I'll meet somebody for lunch. That's about the extent of my social life here. I want to keep a low profile because I don't want to tangle with the people pushing sex-repressive religion, <laughs> you know, as a business. <laughs> uh, and I don't want to mess with the neo Adwaitans either. I'd rather just establish my own thing uh, somewhere far off <laughs> and then go there. Uh, so that's what this is all about. Next time we'll talk about my particular taste, uh, how and why it gets me in trouble, and uh, what we're going to do about it. <laughs> Om Tat Sat. Uh, Buru Saranai.